Hi everyone, my name is Sandra Clark and I am part of the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series team. I want to welcome you to our fourth talk on the F in the FY21 NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. Before we get started, I'd like to Take a few minutes for a few webinar thank yous and details. First, I would like to thank the NOAA Research Council and the awesome team I work with in producing these seminars, without whom none of these talks could happen. The team is Hernan Garcia with the NOAA NESDIS National Centers for Environmental Information, myself with the NOAA NESDIS Office of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Tracy Gill with the NOAA National Ocean Science National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, and Katie Raleigh with the NOAA Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research and the Central, NOAA Central Library. Here are some seminar logistics. Most are listed in the Q&A pod, but all attendees are muted, so please type all your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time. We will address them at the end of the seminar. We are recording this seminar and the recording and the PDFs of the slides will be made available within a few days at the link provided in the chat box. Please note as the recording and chat notes will be available online if you submit a question in the chat box, chat box excuse me, your name, representing your likeness, will be recorded and shared. We often have staffers assist us with the NOAA Leadership Seminars during the Q&A. Today we have the following NESA staff members moderating the questions at the end, and we want to thank them very much for being here. Chad Hamrick, ACIO Program Support, Madden Danell, Lead Technology Architect, Cloud Technical Director, Dana Ostranga, Data Management Architect, and Joseph Manny, IT Specialist and Cloud Architect, and Tracy Gill, who will be moderating the webinar-related questions. We also want to thank our captioner for making the webinar more accessible for our audience. If your system seems to be lagging, please turn off any extra apps you might have on. Also, you might want to watch this webinar in full screen or larger view. To do this, find the four arrow button to the upper right corner of the slides. That four arrow button toggles the full screen view off and on. Looking ahead to our next month's NOAA Environment Leadership Seminar Series, we're actually going to have two seminars next month. We're, going, we're just now, uh, this is kind of breaking news, we will be having Ben Friedman speaking on March 3rd and Dr. Jason Link, Senior Scientist for Ecosystems Management at NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service will be speaking on March 9th. More information for both of those will be coming out soon. You can visit our NOAA Environmental Leadership Series webpage at the link listed in the Q&A pod. We are working to schedule the rest of our speakers for FY21 and beginning to schedule FY22. You can also find recordings and PDFs of all the slides there from past performances. And so today's seminar is titled, NOAA Nestis Transformation with Innovative Technologies. And our speaker is Irene Parker. Assistant Chief Office, excuse me, Assistant Chief Information Officer at the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, otherwise known as NESDIS. And here's some background on her. Ms. Parker has 20 years of experience in all facets of information technology, security, enterprise architect, in both public and private sectors. Her experience ranges from leading information technology organizations, managing cyber risk,
Okay, um, I'll, I'll finish up the intro for Sandra since um, she, we can't hear. Uh, prior to joining Federal Service, Irene held senior positions at Deloitte Consulting and Accenture. While in the private sector, she was responsible for process engineering, strategic planning, and business development. Irene received her Bachelor of Science in Mathematical Sciences from Johns Hopkins University, Whiting School of Engineering in Baltimore, and her Executive Master's in Public Administration from American University. It's a real pleasure to have her speak with us today. Thank you, Mrs. Parker, and with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Sandra and Tracy, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Irene Parker, um, as you just heard my bio, so I'm not gonna go into that. But first of all, I wanna thank the Environmental Leadership Seminar Series um, for inviting me to speak today. And also, I want to thank all of you that have joined today. I hear that we had almost 300 plus um, registration, and I'm pleasantly surprised to see how many people are interested in this topic of how NESDIS is leveraging new innovative technologies that will transform how we do business in the future. So as many of you guys know, NOAA's mission is complex and changes all the time due to the availability of new commercial and partner data and new innovative technologies, which are readily available. The adoption of these technologies will transform how we do our business, enhance the quality of our scientific research and weather prediction. We will bring new products and services to the public in a more timely and effective manner in the future. So this presentation is really gonna talk a lot about the new technologies. And to many of you guys, it's not new. It's actually pretty old. But for NOAA, it's new, and it's going into the area of cloud technology and artificial intelligence. So my agenda for today has basically four parts. Um, the first part is I'm going to give you an overview of NOAA's cloud vision um, and how NESDIS fits into that. And then I'm going to talk about the NESDIS solution of something called the NESDIS Common Cloud Framework. And so you'll hear me call it the NCCF. And then I'm going to talk about data management, which is really key because you can have all the best technologies in the world, but data is key to being able to make our mission successful. And then I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I know these are buzzwords in the AI ML aspect, but I want to talk about how we are applying it within Nestis. All right, so I think this slide has been around now for close to almost two years. Um, I think Dr. Jacobs um, in the prior administration actually developed this slide. So this is NOAA's cloud vision. Um, the NOAA published the uh, NOAA cloud strategy in 2020. And specifically um, in its vision, its goal was to move to the commercial cloud to a reduce costs, increase speed provisioning, have scalability and maintain a high level of security. But the overall tenant that we had in the cloud strategy was that we needed to make sure that NOAA's weather prediction enterprise is no longer constrained by hardware resources. And we wanted to ensure that we remain the permanent global model. Now, not everybody that's on this call um, has tentacles into NOAA's weather prediction, but a NOAA and cloud technologies and AI can be used in all facets of NOAA's scientific and research and weather missions. So again, this is a slide that's been around now, I'm going to say at least two years, and it's what was used to explain why we're going to the cloud. But I'm going to give you my perspective. So many people ask me why we're moving to the cloud, and my answer is for agility and scalability. It, like in the prior slide, most people like to say it's for cost. I'm not gonna say here that the cloud, going to the cloud is cheaper, but I will definitely say that it's gonna help us on agility and scalability. Um, many people who are attending this webinar are, are familiar with how long it takes to get applications and algorithms into an operational environment. It can take several months, if not years. Uh, if we move towards the cloud, NOAA's gonna be able to move capabilities into operations much more quickly to the scalability of the cloud and the other tools the cloud provides. So I love our acquisitions and grant office and I hope you guys are participating, but they also know the pain and suffering it takes to be able to buy hardware 
um, get a vendor to supply it, to get it mailed to one of our data centers, get it installed. It takes almost a year to do that. And when we're ready to deploy an application, that application might become obsolete and the cloud is gonna solve that um, for us. Now, another benefit uh, of the cloud is decreased latency once our observational data and processing are co-located. And latency is very key for one of parts of our no emission of saving lives and property. So the faster we can get out our weather predictions, um, the more we could help save lives and property. Now, when it comes to costs, like I said, I can't say the cloud is always cheaper, but we as no understand the value of our data and the impact of commerce. So using that, we're negotiating more cost effective um, acquisitions. Um, for storage, compute, and data distribution. Um, what's happening right now is the CSPs, the cloud service providers, are providing us with lower publish rates, almost up to 80% in some cases, because they understand that having NOAA's data in the cloud allows other industries to take advantage of NOAA's data within their own CSP's cloud environment, which basically means the CSPs have a new business model to make a profit, which in turn allows NOAA to possibly get advantageous rates for services in the areas of compute and storage. So in the end, like I said, it all goes back to our data. Our data has value. Getting that data out to the user community has value. Um, the cloud service providers see that and therefore they're trying to give us a more cost effective um, rates for us, NOAA, to go to the cloud. So how does NESDIS fit into this? So in my opinion, um, the way that NESDIS fits into this is going back to our agility and scalability. So NESDIS's vision is to be able to build an agile and agile service that will allow us to bring data securely from numerous sources, process that data into a meaningful product and provide it to the user community without building a system to do this for each data source. Um, these common services on this slide uh, are now being built in the cloud environment, uh, specifically in Amazon Web Services. And just to kind of give you guys some background, inside Nesdis, we launch birds, right? We launch satellites, but we also are dependent on a lot of other people's satellites in our international communities like JAXA, India, the Europeans. Um, and right now we're also buying a lot of commercial data like radio occultation data. And then we also bring in non-satellite data and we have to be able to manipulate that data within our algorithms and create usable products. And right now what we keep doing is creating stovepipe systems within NESDIS, um, most often for our major satellite programs. And our vision is to take that and break that down and really truly have a data agnostic common service within the cloud. So to expand on the prior slide, um, NESDIS has, like I said, our own unique set of challenges. Our ground enterprise is currently comprised of disparate sets of systems with different approaches to support operations, science, and archive. So for example, for our geo satellites, we have geo specific ground um, processing capability for our Leo birds, the same thing over and over again. Um, our ground enterprise right now is, in my opinion, is simply unsustainable. Keeping our current approach will outstretch our budgets in the next few years and without accommodating our projected data volumes from new observing systems. Therefore, I must stress this, we have to transform how we do business inside of NESDIS. We need a secure, highly available, scalable solution that meets our current and future needs. And I believe the cloud will help us accomplish this. And I wanna stress the word secure. I know there's a lot of phobia associated with if we go to the commercial cloud or if we don't own the physical server or hardware, our data will not be secure. Um, this is something that I have to stress that that is an incorrect assumption and fear that people bring to the table. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about how the commercial cloud is secure. And when I talk commercial cloud through the rest of this briefing, I want to stress that I am not talking about the public commercial cloud. I am talking about the FedRAMP government approved commercial cloud that even the Intel community and DOD uses. So my key takeaways from this um, 
overview of NOAA and NESDIS's vision is that NOAA needs to move its environmental satellite and other data into a common data repository, ideally in the commercial cloud. Um, we can talk about if it should be on-prem or not, but the key thing is that we need to have our data together. Uh, we need to manage that common data repository in a common scalable infrastructure, and I believe the cloud allows us to do that. By doing this, it will enable robust discoverability and dissemination, which is really key about getting our, our data out there so our user communities can grow and the application of our data can be widely available. In addition, if we make our data available and, and if it's in the cloud, we'll have, be able to have a foundation to meaningfully leverage tools like artificial intelligence and then build off of that with machine learning because it's what's really key is the data and the, having the agility and the scalability to use that data to make meaningful products. So now I'm gonna go more into the NESDIS Cloud Common Framework. Um, I don't know if many of the folks that are on the webinar are technical or not. Um, if you're technical and you have technical questions, um, like uh, Tracy and Sandra said, I have my technical team here to answer questions at the end. Um, and we're happy to have more follow-up discussions about our cloud framework if anyone is interested. So the NESIS Common Cloud Framework, uh, like I said, we refer to it as the NCCF. It's a suite of services that provide end-to-end -end ground system capabilities. It's cloud agnostic, meaning it can run in any cloud, though it's currently running on AWS. So I have to stress here, it doesn't mean I can pick up today from AWS and go to Microsoft Azure or Google tomorrow. It means that the NCCF can be transitioned. We're not vendor locked in, but there will have to be some changes that we would have to make for the transition. When we developed the NCCF, um, we did it through a series of cloud pilots at NESDIS. And one of the things I have to stress is that this was really managed from the federal team perspective. We did not outsource it to a contractor to go and be the brainchild behind this. We really leveraged our federal team um, as a part of the pilot process um, with support of brilliant contractors. Um, but it was truly the brainchild of a handful of very smart federal employees. Um, we've demonstrated that the NCCF meets our organizational mission requirements and that the solution, again, is secure, fault tolerant, scalable, and data agnostic, meaning it can support any data source. Um, it's also decoupled, meaning it has interchangeable services. So when the CSPs develop a new FedRAMP approved service, we can easily incorporate it into, into our framework. So again, going back to my prior comment, we don't want to take months or years trying to put a new capability into operations. We want to have that plug and play flexibility. We want to be able to easily test it out and get it deployed as quickly as possible. And the NCCF um, allows us to do that. Um, slide 12, people ask, why do I bring this slide um, to my presentations? And the reason is everybody has different terminology, has a different lexicon of describing the cloud. So as I move forward in this deck, I just wanted to kind of set high level uh, lexicon. So when I say framework, I basically mean it's a set of services that work together to deliver value. When I say service, it's equivalent to an IT function, such as what we sometimes say like ingest or dissemination. And when I say tool, it's a software application that is used to enable or implement service. So please be mindful of this lexicon as I move forward in this deck. All right, so this slide is a very, very simplified cartoon of the Nessus Common Cloud Framework. And what's great is that you can simplify it because it's not that complicated within Amazon. Um, so what you see in the different bubbles is our services, which again is equivalent to an IT function. So each colored box here represents a service within the NCCF. So we have consolidated ingest in green, we have storage in blue, we have the metadata catalog in orange, we have compute in yellow, we have the science sandbox um, and in pink, and then we have distribution and so on in the gray. Um, this visual depiction displays how we have coupled services to meet our overall IT objectives. 
which is to make sure we do not build stovepipe systems for each NESDIS operational platform or data source. And in the next slide, I'm gonna give a quick overview of each of these services. All right, so this slide has a list of our services um, because we don't have that much time in this briefing. Once you guys have access to the briefing in the backup, just to let you know, there are detailed slides about each of these services. And again, if you guys are interested, we're happy to have further offline conversations about these services. But consolidated ingest, it's a single point of entry for all of our data um, into the NCCF. So it's not just from a security check, um, that we're looking at it, but overall, we're basically assuming that every data set that comes into NESDIS is has zero trust, and then we build up from there and it has the ability to take in files like buffer, grib, net CDF, et cetera. Um, storage, um, it's the foundational service which stores and manages all data. What's really key is inside NESDIS and probably lots of other no line offices, every system has their own storage capability. Our goal here is to have a one um, storage repository for our NESIS capabilities moving forward. Metadata catalog. Um, I'm going to talk more about this and later on the deck, but I cannot stress this enough. Uh, it's very important. It's the repository that manages the metadata. It enables robust data searching and discoverability. This is so key, especially if we're trying to go into AI and leverage machine learning and deep learning. Um, compute. Um, we're using a high performance um, high performance compute based scalability service in the cloud, which is going to support our product generation. Uh, and it's integrated with orchestration and processing. Then we have our science and development sandbox, um, which is a development environment for developers and scientists to develop in, um, the next algorithms. This is really key to make sure our scientists have access to the latest and greatest technologies, um, the services that the CSPs provide those toolbox services. That's one of the core benefits of being in the cloud to be able to give our scientists access to those tools. They're gonna to be able to enable much more and more robust algorithms in the future. Software release management. Um, they're the tools that support our common configuration management for the entire NCCF. This is really key. So going back to the agility, um, what, what is really key is the software release management. If we weren't doing the continuous development integration process, um, it would be taking, again, months, if not years, to get things into operations. Then we have the distribution and access service. Um, it's a flexible service um, that gets data out to the users. Our goal is hopefully one day to bring the users to the data instead of us sending data to the users. But again, uh, it's capable of doing both. And like I said, I know I just went through this really quickly. But when you guys get access to the deck, uh, a lot of the details for each of the services are in the backup slides. So, um, like I said, NCCF was built via the cloud pilots, but it's now a working solution and it is operational. Um, we got the framework um, designed and built um, within seven months. So, I would say for NESDIS, that's very quick. Um, I don't know if that, how that compares to, you know, NOS or fisheries or weather service, but for NESDIS, that was a huge, uh, feat. Um, our framework is built to evolve over time, like I said, and we are incorporating new tools, um, to meet future mission objectives. So right now we're in the process of bringing in, uh, commercial radio occultation data, Hemawari data, um, et cetera. And most importantly, it's secure. Um, and it's fault tolerant and it's capable of processing our near real time uh, data flows. The other thing I wanna stress is you're hearing me gloat about the NCCF, but I wanna also let you guys know that we actually had an independent technical evaluation team um, that were subject matter experts that came from Air Force, NASA, USGS, and then within our own NOAA family uh, from OAR and NOAA OCIO. Um, and they conducted an independent assessment. And the um, panel um, spent um, time reviewing 
all of our documentation and the solution. And they did issue um, some RFAs, which are requests for action, but there were no showstoppers. Um, overall, the panel agreed that the NCCF met Nezis's operational requirements and furthermore could serve as a foundational cloud architecture for all of NOAA. Um, and that was a huge statement uh, for them to make, and we we're very happy to hear that. And for the past year, we've been working with the other line offices, um, learning from them, like learning from NOS, learning from fisheries, um, and expanding how we can leverage the NCCF um, for our for NOAA holistically, and even with NASA now, we're collaborating with them to see how they could maybe possibly leverage the NCCF or how we can um, expand the capability of the NCCF. Now, the one thing I have to stress here um, is that what they stress that our biggest challenge was not a technical challenge, but it was related to workforce management. Um, what they say, stated was that NOAA was not a cloud ready organization, that many of our technical staff were not yet, wet yet, not yet well versed in cloud technology, and that there were many people that felt threatened by the cloud and innovative technologies. Um, this wasn't something that was a sh like uh, new to us. We were very aware that this was a concern and NESDIS has been addressing that with training programs, hands-on integration with our pilot teams. But this is something I wanna stress that the technology is not our biggest hurdle inside NOAA. Even the data management isn't the biggest hurdle inside NOAA. It's getting NOAA and the people inside NOAA to see the value of these types of technologies, willing to adapt, willing to see how they could actually help the mission um, is what's really key. It's a change management aspect in my opinion. So um, that was pretty going pretty quickly through the Nessus Common Cloud Framework. There's so much more behind it than those cartoons. Uh, however, due to time, we can't really go into all those details. But the next section I'm going to go into is the role of data management. So data management, I don't think we talk enough about this in the IT space. I think uh, the NOS talks about it a lot. Um, the EDMC um, talks about it a lot, but it doesn't really funnel down as much into the IT community. And I have to say that it goes hand in hand for us to be successful. I think the role of data management has long been overlooked. And now that we are migrating to the cloud, it's abundantly clear that we must address our data management issues. Um, to maximize the value of NOAA's data, it must be in cloud optimized formats. Uh, it has to be analysis ready data and it has to be have to have optimized metadata with appropriate tagging. This is a challenge inside NOAA. Although we have required NOAA data management plans for all of our programs, um, it's not streamlined and we don't actually enforce those data management plans to be executed. Um, my goal is that when we do achieve this type of setup, we will have much more meaningful discoverability of our NOAA data, and this will provide incredible value to our scientists, our novice users, and the public. Keep in mind that if we don't have optimized data, we won't be able to use some of the new innovative tools in the AI, ML, you know, neural networks aspect because they are very much dependent on the data, the tagging of the data. Um, I cannot stress this enough. This slide, um, the reason I, we put this slide in here is that one of NOAA's goals is to make our data more discoverable and accessible across a broader external user community. So to do this, we need to know those user, who those user communities are and what applications can utilize NOAA data. So this diagram is an example of data across the NOAA enterprise, and I know it's not the whole enterprise, it's just an example, um, that spans different disciplines and the applications that can utilize that data by different communities. 
So once we make our data more readily available, the user community will grow and the application value of our data will grow. We will see NOAA's data be used in ways we never thought were possible, both in our internal NOAA community and our external communities. So now let's talk about what everybody's talking about in the news. It's the, you know, it's the new, latest and greatest um, AI and ML, right? So a few years ago, it was cloud. Now NOAA's catching up on cloud. Now we're going into AI and ML. There are many people say that they're doing AI and ML, but are they? And let's see how NOAA's doing it. So first, let's go to terminology. People like to use these buzzwords, right? So what is artificial intelligence and what is machine learning? So AI involves computers to do things that are traditionally requiring human intelligence. This means creating algorithms to classify, analyze, and draw predictions from data. The difference between AI and regular programming is that regular programming defines all possible scenarios and only operates within those defined scenarios. AI trains a program for specific tasks and it allows it to explore and improve on its own. Many of you probably have heard the analogy that Microsoft Word cannot improve on its own, but facial recognition software can get better at recognizing faces the longer it runs. So I've heard a lot of people inside NOAA kind of convolute um, saying that they do AI, but it really is more general programming um, as they're defining scenarios. It's not true AI where it's not truly exploring and evolving and improving on its own. Now, as for machine learning, it's an application of AI that provides a system, the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without explicitly being programmed. So machine learning algorithms identify patterns and or predict outcomes. So an example is, right, Netflix uses machine learning to continually improve their member experience by giving us personalized recommendations based on what you watch and then what similar uh, other people watch with similar preferences. So that's how we get on Netflix, you know, all of our different, you know, thumb t uh, tags on, you know, watch this show, watch that show. So the key thing is to apply AI and ML, you need data and lots of it. And this is something NOAA and NESDIS has. And as previously mentioned in the prior part of this presentation, data management and a centralized data repository would allow NOAA and the outside community to leverage AI and ML techniques, especially for in the cloud. Um, being able to use Google's TensorFlow, I mean, and, and to have that data at our fingertips to be able to train different algorithms would be hugely beneficial across all of NOAA's uh, line offices, in my opinion. So how is NESDIS exploring AI and machine learning? So we just recently uh, entered into an agreement with Google uh, to jointly explore if AI tools can enhance our weather forecasting and research capabilities using satellite data. Um, from our technical perspective, it's, a goal, its goal is to develop an AI-based capability that can do multi-source data fusion and assimilation to generate outcomes that could be useful in weather prediction. So people wanted to know how we actually got that agreement in place. And we leveraged something called an OTA, which is an other transaction authority uh, which uh, Congress had given us that authority as a part of the National Drought Information System Reauthorization Act of 2018. Um, an OTA, it's a contractual agreement um, that allows a commercial entity and the government to jointly plan and execute pilots. And, and what's really key is that we both contribute funds. So Google's contributing resources and NESDIS is contributing resources and we both share in the intellectual property rights with anything that's developed jointly. Um, so we just got this awarded, like I said, in September, and we're in our early phases of working with Google, which I'll go more into details in the next few slides. So what are the goals of the Google OTA agreement? Um, there are two at a high level. First, it's to explore if an OTA type relationship can yield tangible benefits for NOAA. So it's the first OTA NOAA's done. Um, so again, it's to see, you know, is it a valid um, type of contract we could use to build relationships? 
The second is to determine if we can enhance our weather forecasting and research with AI and ML tools and techniques for our satellite on data assimilation areas. The OTA agreement will provide direct exposure for our NOAA scientists um, to some of the best AI expertise available. Um, just, you know, I think many people would say Google is the world leader in this area and we're going to have access to them. Um, as stated earlier, um, if the team, both Google and NOAA, develop usable code, um, then NOAA will share in the intellectual property rights. This was uh, a lot of fun negotiation with our general counsel from both sides. So again, we're learning from that. Um, and we believe this effort could very well address some of our challenges with big data by providing more accurate and timely weather prediction. So, I, Irene, we have a okay. question. Uh, we have a question from Ted. Um, does on the OTA does the intellectual property rights apply to use um, by your taxpayers? So I will have to take that question offline and get a formal answer from General Counsel, unless the team knows if, if Chad or or Joe or anybody knows specifically. They are well, the intellectual. Go ahead, Joe. When we were in discussion, they wanted to settle on a Creative Commons license, so it should be available. But we'll get the exact um, type of Creative Commons license. Back All right. So we will formally get you a response to that. Okay. All right, so um, more details on the Google OTA project framework. Um, so just to let you all know, there have been some um, challenges with our initial engagement with Google. Um, Google is very progressive and desires to work in a pure agile research mode with no constraints. I'm sure you can appreciate that is not how NOAA operates in certain line offices. Uh, to help us manage our engagement with Google, we developed an OTA project framework, which is comprised of what we call inspiring headlines, NOAA project lists, and projects for execution. Our joint team met for over a month to develop potential AI projects that could be executed. And these projects are, are a part of the NOAA project list, and we can provide this to folks if anyone's actually interested in that list. All the projects on the project list are then links, linked to a success headline, which is on the slide. Um, there are five success headlines. And then this is what we would communicate up and out, and the projects are then identified for execution. We currently have um, projects that have been approved for execution, and they're related to the first two headlines, uh, which is combining AI and physics to improve forecast skills. And the second headline, using AI to increase the rate of data assimilation in the NOAA models from 3%, which is current, to 30%. So again, we are just in the initial phases, and we're hoping to see some really good results in the upcoming months working together with Google. So in closing, I know I covered a lot really quickly and we're going to have time for a Q&A, but I want to stress the following points. Um, NOAA has a complex mission and it has stovepipe systems. Um, and some of those systems might be using antiquated methodologies. Um, with the availability of new data sources and increased volumes of data, NOAA and NESDIS has an incredible opportunity to take advantage of these latest technologies. Um, to maximize on those opportunities, we need to adopt and implement new and innovative technologies. Like I said, the buzzwords right now are cloud, AI, ML, uh, agile, DevOps, but you know that may change in the next six months. So we need to always be looking at what those opportunities are and how they fit to enhance and enable our mission. And I have to stress that just moving to the cloud is not enough. We need to ensure that we structure the data we migrate to the cloud in a manner that allows us to search for it and disseminate it in a robust manner. A lot of people believe, oh, I can just you know, move the data as is. 
and I'm going to be able to use the AI and ML services that the CSPs provide. That's not accurate. We need to do this thoughtfully uh, across NOAA. And once we have the data in the cloud um, that's tagged appropriately in optimized formats, like I said, then we can start exploiting tools, uh, start to exploit it using tools like AI and ML. And I've had numerous conversations with many folks about how we can do that. And this is something that I believe working um, with our acting chief data officer, Tony Lavoie and his team will be able to truly accomplish that within NOAA. So now I'm gonna open it up um, to questions, but I wanna thank you all for allowing me to present um, this topic to you today. I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their schedule to join this discussion. And so we're gonna open it up, I believe, to questions. Irene, on the Google OTA, there was a question from Ted. Um, how much control does Google have um, on the project list that executes? Executed? Okay, so this has been actually one of the lessons learned that we've been learning with them. They have a good amount of say because both the government and Google can walk away from the OTA anytime. So as a part of the negotiation and that project framework that I talked about, uh, we had to go back and forth. So their researchers are called Googlers and they have to be enticed to wanna to work on a problem. So what we did was create those headlines to entice them, but they did have, they did have a significant say it is a joint team. Okay. Uh, Hernan has asked a question um, concerning data management. And uh, it is, unless data users know where to look for data at NOAA, external and internal NOAA data users cannot readily discover and find data. Uh, we are one NOAA with different data streams. Uh, for example, there is no data search engine at um, the NESDAS or NOAA websites. How could we improve data access across NOAA? Anon, really great question. So inside NESDIS, we're actually working with NOAA and NCI to evaluate a tool called CMR, the Consolidated Metadata Repository. And we are actually ex just kicked off a pilot um, to evaluate that and see how we can leverage that as the core metadata repository for the NESDIS Common Cloud Framework. Um, and then we are going to work with the EDMC to do an evaluation to see if this would be something that would be beneficial across NOAA. There is a, another question on data management. Can you explain the data tagging um, process? Okay, so this is... So date, well, let's talk, if it's data tagging for AI, we're actually just in the process of learning how to do that. And that's gonna be something that we're gonna learn as a part of the Google um, OTA of how should we tag, what should we tag for AI and ML service tools to be able to having, having a meaningful data repository. As for tagging just for search and accessibility, that's something that we're looking at um, again, one of the areas that we're looking at is using the open source capability of the CMR, the Consolidated Metadata Repository. Also on data management from Ted, um, I hope that the analysis ready data uh, is in the most in, is is the most important link. Uh, government data is not clean many times. Uh, uh, what about contractors being incentivized to clean data they use? That's food for thought, Ted. Um, I, don't, I don't have a reaction to that or a, a specific response, except I think that's something that we should possibly consider. There is a general question, which um, uh, I think Tracy will ask. People are asking about access to the presentation. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Tracy, you are gonna make this presentation available to all the participants afterwards. Is that correct? Yes, the um, presentation will be available at the library website that we posted earlier on the Q&A pod, and I will post it again. It'll probably, at the recording and the PDF will likely be up by tomorrow.
Um, there's a question from Scott. Um, what are the what is the status and plans for class moving to the cloud? All right, um, Scott. So right now we're in the process of actually moving. I want to say close to 15 petabytes of our class data into the Amazon cloud. We kicked that project off this past September of 2020, and we started moving data, I want to say around the holiday time frame. So we're actually in the process of moving that data. Um, we're mostly focused right now on um, the backup copy that used to be in Boulder. That's the data that we are moving into the cloud, and then the primary will continue feeding that. So the primary class will still stay in Asheville for the time being, but the data will be concurrently sent to the cloud. Um, the bigger area is how do we plan to address archive holistically in the cloud and not as a one-off service. I'll also point out that there's several comments just for the that have come in about the links on the page um, not working here. Um, we will, they do work, they don't work in this application. Um, so you can copy and paste them into another browser and they will work. If you experience problems with that, please, um, uh, we'll send out clarification at a, at a later time as where you can get to. Hi, it's Irene. Did, we, did I lose my connection or I'm not hearing anything? I can hear you. I think, um, I think the staff's working okay. on the question. Dad, do you have a question? Eileen, I had a question okay, while we're waiting. So are you aware of how other Miller line offices are working, um, are using the cloud and are line offices working together um, on the, the cloud yeah, system? Yeah, so um, under the s and strategies that the Admiral was leading, there is a cloud um, strategy. And that has been uh, taken on by Nancy in uh, Fisheries, the acting ACIO. And as a part of the NOAA CIO Council, we've been working collaboratively together. I will still say we are still doing it separately. Like um, some people are on Amazon, some people are on Microsoft Azure, some people are going to Google. But the, the framework is similar. And the security is something that we've been really focused on holistically across NOAA to make sure we do that at an enterprise level. But from the actual framework of ingest to processing in the repository, not as much. Okay, thank you. And I saw Chad dropped off. Chad, are you back with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Richard had a question uh, with her AI ML. Um, will, the, will the work be done non-cloud centric? And basically, will there be a dependency on Google Cloud? Okay, so the work as a part of the OTA will be done in Google Cloud, but the software solution, if there is any kind of code that is developed, it is supposed to be as a standalone application, ideally. That, I think Ted's follow-up question, same thing, was if you move away from Google, what does that mean for AI and ML across organizations? Yeah. Uh, and is training an issue? Really great question. So training wise, I think it's very important that, like I stressed in the independent review team stress, we got to get NOAA trained in cloud and it needs to be across the major providers, uh, Amazon, Azure, Google. I mean, I know Oracle's in play, et cetera, but you know, those would be the three. But I will tell you, most of the cloud vendors have very similar techniques and tools. Now, Google, when it comes to AI and TensorFlow, if you're aware, they, they are in the lead. Microsoft is coming up in that area. Um, 
again, my understanding is, is that if we have the tagging done correctly, we'll be able to leverage those services provided by non-Google CSPs and leverage those tools to help us do AI and ML. But I, I will say there is always some form of vendor lock-in. Um, and doesn't mean that we'll be locked in it forever. We might have to transition and reconfigure or recode some of our uh, algorithms, but they still should be able to port over. Now, if we start using specific tools that each vendor might have their own proprietary association with, that's a difficult challenge, but that's a risk-based decision that no one needs to make is that do we take on that lock-in versus the value that the solution brings to our mission. AJ asked a question, how is uh, Nezis employing AI, uh, AI ML to automate routine but human intensive operations to optimize operations? Okay, it looks like, oh, Irene, it looks like she might have dropped off, but I think she's coming back. I'm back. Sorry. For some reason, hey, I think okay. I got cut off. Got a noisy All right. Day to Did you? So, um, Did you so going back, the answer is no, we have not taken a look at that, but it's a good area to take a look at. Um, we are just starting the process with Google, like I said, in those two headlines. However, an area that NESDIS has done a lot of AI work was with the Go 17 ABI issue, working with NASA, um, and, but not yet on day-to-day -day operations. Um. Another question from Steve, you mentioned discoverability and potential for new uses of NOAA data. How can these technologies help NOAA better service NOAA's existing customers and who um, are, are more invested in, in continuity of services than perhaps of novel users? Okay, so I would say from at least Nesdis's perspective, we are one with our real-time operational users. I think we know what they want, National Weather Service, FAA, Air Force, uh, et cetera. So when it comes to our real-time users, I think we are truly integrated with their requirements. As for the larger user community, Nesdis has a user um, engagement um, strategy and a user engagement a liaison and working group that is run by our director of comms um, inside NESDIS. And we're trying to reach out to those user stakeholders um, and trying to figure out what they want and what value could they be getting from our data that we don't provide, or if we gave them access to the data, what value do they see? So we've been working with the fire weather uh, group. We've been working with the co-insurance group. We've been working with a lot of different communities. But what's been really interesting is the common theme is going back to what Hernan said earlier, is can we get access to the data? Can we get access to it qu quickly? Um, and will you ensure that it's always going to be available? There's a follow-up question on class. Is there a, an expectation that class data will be accessible once the backup copy is migrated into the cloud? I would hope so, but at this time, we haven't made a decision yet um, within the NESDIS organization. Um, Another question going back to the Google OTA, is Google performing the test and evaluation of ML algorithms in addition to developing them? Or is there concern about having a, a, a third party evaluate and track algorithms for model shift and explainability? I'm gonna have to call a friend, Chad. So that would be Joe, do you know the answer to that? And if not, we can find out the answer. Well, Chad, I'm, I'm having trouble following that question. Where was it? What was the name? Um, it was from AJ, near the bottom, third from the bottom. I see it. So, 
it's a partnership. We're going to bring the scientific expertise. They have all the expertise in AI ML techniques, so they're going to use it's all research. So they're going to try it and see which works, uh, which techniques work, um, and hopefully you'll find some breakthroughs when this is done. But nothing's guaranteed yet. I hope that answers your question. That's as deep as I can get. Um, there's other folks who can talk about the actual internals of how they're going to do it. But right now, we're just getting started. We're going to start the data migrations into Google, uh, the copies, and then the scientists will get access to it and then begin their research. So AJ, we'll, we'll take that action and get back to you and talk with Sid Bukabara and find out more details associated with that. Uh, there's a question on, um, uh, in the past, uh, there has not been a, a cost associated with data retrieval and preparation. Uh, will there be a way to reduce the cost of egress for internal um, to NOAA data users um, that use the data operationally? Okay, so interesting question. So. If the data is in the cloud, yes, there's an egress cost to bring the data back to an on-premise capability. Nesdis's goal is to, like I said, bring users to the data. Um, if we are egressing the data out of the cloud because the user is not in the same cloud environment or they need to bring it back to on-premise, Nesdis is building in those costs for our operational requirements. I am not seeing any other questions. Uh, the other, you know, Joe, Manan, or Dana, is there anything else that you think is important to raise? All right, if there are questions that we missed, I apologize, but we will make sure that offline, we will answer those questions and get it out to the, uh, to the seminar liaison to make sure it gets available back to this group. But thank you, everybody. I really did appreciate the opportunity to, to, to have this uh, webinar with all of you all. Mm -hmm. Looks like there might be a few more questions, but I don't oh, know I if you want to take these now or later. Um, Chad, you decide if you want to take these later. I'm going through them just a moment. All right, there's a question from Ted. Is the U.S. considering um, cloud service in, in the U.S. only? Offshore may not be so secure. Politically, this could be a problem depending on the administration. Uh, we, uh, NOAA, are all, and as a part of Department of Commerce, are only allowed to use uh, FedRAMP certified cloud environments, and they are required to be on U.S. soil. Uh, Richard asked a question on the Google OTA. Is Google um, Anthos, which uh, work on hybrid cloud, uh, being looked at or considered, given that we are moving 15 terabytes uh, to AWS uh, uh, for class data, and Google is developing the AI ML. So for Google, from oh, my oh. understanding, oh, go ahead, Joe. So short answer is no. The 15 petabytes that class is moving is going to stay in AWS, and that's for classes purposes. There's a smaller subset of data that we're going to be moving to Google for the AI ML, and that's project-based. So each project defines their own data needs. But Anthos is not being considered right now. Okay. There's another question you just came in on um, AI with Google. Is NOAA able to leverage the expertise of Google engineers to provide guidance and best practices on how NOAA should structure its data and services? Melissa, the short answer is yes. It's one of the key things that we want to get out of this from the, the OTA. Mm -hmm. 
That's all the questions we've received so far. All right. Um, I'm happy to stay on if there are more questions. I know we have till technically till 315, but um, if there aren't any, then again, I want to say thank you to everybody. I really appreciate it. And we'll make sure that the presentation is available. Um, and again, please feel free to reach out to me, irene.parker at noaa.gov, um, if you have any questions and if you want to have more detailed dialogue more probably with my subject matter experts than me, but I'd be happy to have those conversations. Ms. Parker, thank you so much for such a terrific talk, a very timely talk. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Sandra again, and I want to thank everyone for joining us again today. I, uh, we really appreciate your attendance. To remind you again, we're having two seminars coming up in March. One will be March the 3rd. This is breaking news, so we'll get details to you, but Ben Friedman will be talking on our, our series on March the 3rd, and then, <clears throat> forgive me, excuse me, on Tuesday, March the 9th at 2 p.m., we will be hearing from Dr. Jason Link, Senior Scientist for Ecosystem Management at NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service Office. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We appreciate it. We'll see you in a few weeks. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Bye, Irene. Thank you, staffers. Thank you, captioner. Bye-bye.